Morning Church. May we please stand so that we can read our memory verse. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Let's read together. So then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Amen. You may have our seats. Amen. Um, so, this year we have been on the topic building up, and uh, that's even why we're reading that memory verse, because that memory verse talks about how we are of God's household, we are of uh, citizens in his kingdom, and God in his kingdom is building something here on the earth. His kingdom is what he wants to build through his children um, that, is, that are in the body of Christ. And even as we speak on building up, uh, we are highlighting how as Christ is the foundation and he has built the foundation of the church in the truth of the gospel that we know so well in the Bible, he also expects from us um, to join him in the work that he's doing in the earth. And over the, over the past uh, couple of months, we've covered topics um, that speak on how we are to build the kingdom of God. We've spoken on things like giving. We've spoken on forgiving. We've spoken on, on the need and the importance of prayer. And these are cultures and ways of living that mirror God's eternal kingdom. Ways of living that flow from his nature and ways of living that he calls us to live. And over the past couple of weeks, I taught uh, on prayer and the importance of prayer and how if we are to do anything of eternal impact, we need to connect with God um, in the prayer place, not just on Sundays or special occasions and not just at prayer meetings, but privately and personally, we need to build our relationship with God and pray to him, not just for ourselves, but for his kingdom to come. And we should do that consistently, we should do that daily, and we should do that as a culture if you call yourself a believer and are in the church. Now, today I've titled the message, How Then Shall We Live? And uh, God willing, over the next couple of weeks, um, I'll cover just a couple of topics on this because when we move from the place of prayer into everyday life, the question may be, how then should we live? I have prayed, I've connected with God, and I spend time with Him. I spend time with, in community, with, with, I spend time in community in the church, but when I go out the door into everyday life, how then should I live? And today the topic will cover particularly the mind of Christ. Because what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? And the reason why I feel it's important is because if we are to talk about how we are to live, a good place to start is the mind. And the reason I say it's the mind is because everything that we do flows from the mindsets that we have as individuals. It's how we think that shapes the way that we live our life. It's how we think that we um, interact with the world and interface with individuals. It's the mind that is a powerful tool that governs those sh and, and shapes the output of our lives. The output of our lives is a product of the things that is going on in our mind and in our hearts. And so a good place to start is to speak on the mind of Christ. Because in secular psychology and uh, in, in, in science, it's very apparent that the mind is a wonderful and powerful entity. All creative innovation, whether it's in technology, whether it's in art, whether it's in creative spaces, whether it's in the sciences, all find their source within the minds of individuals. And the power of the mind, even independent of God, has a latent power to be able to create, a latent power to be able to innovate, and the importance 
of the mind is, I mean, rather the power of the mind is seen in everyday life. The technology that we depend upon was because of people who thought up these inventions and made them available to us to use. The stories that we read, the entertainment and the movies that we see, and the advances made in that are all governed by, or rather find their source in the minds of individuals who applied their minds to whatever work they were doing. And now in technology, we even see that we are pushing the boundaries of this because we have things like AI. And AI is now something that uh, is, uh, is people are talking about a lot because AI is beginning to mimic the way the human mind works. Um, and if you see that picture there, that was generated by AI. And what I typed in was the mind of Christ and one of the options that came up was that. But that's just an indication of just how advanced technology is moving and how much AI or other technologies is gonna govern the way the, the world works and things going into the future. But at the back of that, we have people and people's minds who came together and created um, such technologies with such power. And there's debate on whether AI is going to test the boundaries of human intelligence because it has an ability to um, get a lot of information and synthesize it at once. However, from an article I read, it says, despite AI's world-bending abilities, machines still pale in comparison to the human mind on a host of tasks. Because even algorithms built to replicate the function of the human brain are relatively unsophisticated compared to the inner workings of our mind. That is the power of the human mind. And the bottom line is that our minds are incredibly powerful. Motivational speakers speak on the power of the mind and they get people to shift their mindset in order to shift their lives. And it, sometimes they have results. They have results not because they're good, they have results because there is a latent power that God in his nature and in his image grafted into the human mind. In many, businesses, in many businesses, they focus on training, not just on technical skills. In my line of work, I have been in trainings which were not about the work that I do, but exclusively about the mindset that I have and building a growth mindset or whatever it may be. Because even corporations themselves understand that if they're to be more profitable, they need to invest in the mindsets that their employees have. The mind... <clears throat> Excuse me, the mind, I mean, the world understands the power of the mind. I'm really encouraged by um, the children's ministry movement and what Omega um, was sharing a bit earlier because what brings joy to my heart is that right now in the Sunday school and in the Sunday schools of other churches, children's minds are being shaped. Truth is being planted into their minds. Truth is being planted so that eventually it will be able to shape and graft the way that they walk out their lives. And if you're a parent here today, I don't need to tell you that the enemy has his plan for your children. He has planted seeds to shape the way that they think. Whether it's in, in the school or whether it's with the, their fellow peers or whether it's on social media, whether it's on, 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 popular, on popular TV or Netflix, the enemy is planting seeds in your children's minds that will shape the way that they think as they grow up. It's not just incredible people that, have, that, um, that leverage the power of the mind, but those that understand its latent power make plans early on in life. So it's an encouraging thing to hear what is happening with the children's ministry because what we are doing is we are planting seeds to expel the already laid out plans and work of the enemy in planting or rather in leveraging uh, people's minds and shaping their lives. And the mind is too important to ignore because if we are to build the kingdom of God, if we are to build a kingdom that is outside of time and is, exists in an eternal realm, we cannot do so without carrying the mind of Christ. We cannot build the kingdom of God without carrying the mind of the one who has built it and the one who is building it through our hearts and through our lives. So we need to understand that as believers, we have the mind of Christ. I'm going to read a few scriptures. 
um, in Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9, it says, this is the Lord speaking, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6 to 8, and verses 12 to 16, it says the following, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us in God, by God. These things we also speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen? Paul says that we have the mind of Christ. And, and in the scriptures that I've read, I've spoke, God himself highlights aspects of how he thinks and how he thinks and the way that his mind operates is very different from our own. The mind of Christ embodies the attitudes and wisdoms and abilities of our eternal king. And because he is God, his capacity and his mind is infinite. We are told that we have the mind of Christ. And Christ's capacity is infinite. He's wiser than the wisest king. He's the author of creativity himself. He's the most creative. And his pure brilliance and his mind supersedes any intellectual that we could ever know or think up. And by his spirit, the scripture says that we ourselves have the mind of Christ. Now, when I think on this, at least for me, I may struggle sometimes or rather begin to think that what having the mind of Christ means is that now I have the capacity to be more intelligent than Einstein or to be more wiser than Solomon himself or more creative than Leonardo da Vinci or more focused than the CEOs of multi-billion dollar corporations. The excitement is that I'm going to operate at a much higher level than all of the greatness that I've seen in this world. But the problem with that kind of thinking is that it's too earthly. It's too attached to the examples that we see in the world today. In as much as, yes, God has more infinite capacity than any man that has ever walked, Isaiah 55 says that his ways, or rather his thoughts, are not our thoughts. The mind of Christ isn't Einstein upgraded. It's not an upgraded version of positive thinking or the law of attraction. It's not a higher level of what it is we know ourselves. What the mind of Christ is first and foremost is that it's different. It's different from the way that we think. It's different from our weighing scales. It's different from the criteria that we would give to say that, oh, this is great, and this is how, um, I mean, sorry, this is how excellent Christ is. Christ initially, or rather God in, the, in his wisdom, tells us in Isaiah 55 that his thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are very different from the way that we think. Whatever reasoning we use to come to conclusions is God is saying that the way that I get to conclusions and the way that I act is very different from you. And the only way we will know is if he tells us. 
The only way we'll know is if he gives his mind to us. We cannot figure out our way to the mind of Christ. We have to receive it because his ways are very different from our own. His mind is infinite in its capacity. Because in Isaiah 55, it says as well that his thoughts are as far, as far above, as high as the heavens are from the earth. So much higher are his thoughts than ours. The capacity of his thinking is infinite. It is perfect. And it moves outside of anything we could ever attain in our own strength. And in Romans 12, 2, it says that we need to have our minds renewed that we may understand the perfect will of God. The mind of Christ is hardwired to the perfect will of God. The mind of Christ knows what the perfect will of God is and executes it. And lastly, in 1 Corinthians 2, where, where Paul himself says we, are the mind, we have the mind of Christ, the point I want to highlight from the passage I read is that the mind of Christ is inaccessible to the rulers of this age. The mind of Christ is inaccessible to the enemy because in 1 Corinthians 2, it says that we, the wisdom of God is in a mystery and it is hidden because if the rulers of this age would have known the mind of Christ or rather the mind of our Lord, they would not have crucified him. They would not have crucified him because that is what led Christ unchained to be able to have victory over death, hell, and the grave. And the reason we have salvation today was because the rulers of this age crucified him and hung him on a cross. The wisdom and the mind of God is inaccessible to the rulers of this age. It is out of reach. And that should give us comfort and joy because it knows that when, if we are subscribed to the Lord and we walk by his spirit, the enemy will not be able to figure out God's plan because it's inaccessible to him. But his mind is made available through his spirit to us through Christ Jesus. Because in verse 13, it says, These things we also speak not in words which man wis man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. The Holy Spirit has resident within us grants us an opportunity for us to have the mind of Christ. And this is the mind of Christ. We see it in Philippians 2, verse 5 to 8. Paul, towards the end of the, his life, writes the following. He says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So we ourselves indeed can inspire to have the mind of Christ, but then we can speak of having more wisdom and being more creative and having more capacity but those are not the things that Paul emphasizes. When Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, speaks of the mind of Christ, he notes key features of the mind of Christ. He speaks about humility. He speaks about service. And he speaks about obedience to God. These are the noteworthy things that Paul highlights about the mind of Christ. How then shall we live? We should live by the following mindset, by the same mind that was in Christ that we see in Philippians 2, through humility, through service, and obedience to God. These are the pillars that frame the mindset of our Lord. And you need to understand that because Scripture is inspired, every single word that is written in Scripture is purposefully written. God did not allow Paul to use bandwidth to speak of just how much wiser, how much greater, even though Christ is all of those things. But with the bandwidth that the Holy Spirit gave Paul, he said, highlight these noteworthy pillars of the mind of Christ. Highlight his humility in that he emptied himself of his reputation. Highlight the fact that he came as a servant 
and not to be served, and highlight the fact that he was obedient to God. That is the mind of Christ that should be each, in each and every one of us. On the first point of humility, we see that Christ, or rather it says, he made himself of no reputation in verse 7. And essentially what that word means is that he emptied himself of his divine position and power. In the heavens, he was God. In the heavens, he was the son of God. In John 1, and, I, and, and Nate touched a bit on this earlier on, in John 1, he was the word that was there in the beginning. But he was also the word that became flesh. But when he became flesh, he chose to relinquish his royal estate. He chose to set aside all the infinite power that he commanded. He chose to lay, lay aside and to walk away from the service of countless angels and the excellence that exists beyond the cosmos. He decided to step down into humanity. He emptied himself of the reputation of the king of glory in the highest of heavens to come as the form of a man. And he came in humility because he opted to be born to a carpenter in an obscure village. This was not merely a descent, but it was monumental. It was massive because from the throne of divinity, he stepped down to take on the frailty of humanity. Humanity in its weak frame is what Christ himself chose. And when he chose it, he said, I'm going to be born to a simple family in an obscure village. If I was God and I had the opportunity to choose, I would not choose an obscure village. Perhaps I would have chosen to be born to a rich family in Masaki. And at least I get to start life from that point, which may bear some fade resemblance to what I'm used to. But what our Lord chose is that he said he's going to be born in a manger, in a banda, in Bethlehem, and then to be raised in an obscure village in Nazareth. Because if you read the Gospels, time and time again, people say, what good can come from Nazareth? Or no prophet can come from Nazareth. It is one of those places where it's like nothing good can come from that place. And it will be some obscure village outside of town or in another region altogether. Yet our Lord decided to empty himself of all reputation that he was familiar with. Because he retained the title of the Son of God. And angels and demons knew who he was. But he was okay with people having low regard for him. And all throughout his life, they had a low regard for him because he decided to empty himself of reputation. If we are to have the mind of Christ, we need to cultivate an attitude that does not cling to titles and positions. If we are to have the mind of Christ, we are not to be of those who demand respect because of who they are. We're not those to say, do you know who I am? when you feel that you're being disrespected or not given your rightful due because of the position that you have attained in your life. Whether it's in church, whether it's in school, whether it's in your career, whether it's in the household, we do not take on a position where we begin to demand respect for the repute or rather the positions that we hold. We should rather prefer and honor others as better than ourselves, looking at the example of Christ looking at the fact that as a king, he emptied himself of all reputation and decided to be counted among the simple. And whether you are a king or a servant, whether you are a celebrity or a waiter, whether you are a CEO or a cleaner, we have this mind that was in Christ, who emptied himself of reputation. It does not mean you depreciate yourself because Christ did not depreciate himself. He knew who he was his whole life. But when he walked, he walked in a manner that did not give high emphasis on what people thought about him. So whether the crowd was there with him or whether the crowd had deserted him, he was fine because he knew exactly, or rather his mindset was a mindset that came from the kingdom of heaven itself. It was a mindset that was in him when he stepped off of his throne and came down. And that is the mindset that we need to cultivate as believers. The second point is service. 
Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give himself, or to give his life as a ransom for many. The one who should have rightfully be served by all creation came as a born servant, to serve and to serve others with his life, literally. The reason he came was not just to have a holiday on earth, the reason he came was to serve his creation, to serve humanity and mankind. There's a story in the Bible just before Christ goes to the cross at the Lord's Supper, or just before, he, uh, he asks his disciples to sit down, and then he grabs a towel, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Now, the washing of the feet of the disciples was reserved for the person of the lowest level of servanthood within a household. Within a household, there were people, particularly people of wealth, had many servants, and the lowest of the low was given the job of washing people's feet. And that is what Christ did as a symbol to show how he crouched down, taking on the form of humanity to come and serve us. And he washed each of his disciples' feet. And in my personal life, I remember an example from many, many years ago where one day I was sitting in the living room and my wife decided to come with a basin. I know I'm embarrassing her. Um, but I'll tell the story anyway. Um, I was sitting in the living room, and she came with a basin. Um, and I didn't know why she came with a water basin. Um, but she came with that basin, and she had a towel, and she began to wash my feet. Now, what moved her to do that, I do not know. But what I can say is that it made me feel a certain type of way. And yes, it's a lot of honor. Yes, it's, it, it, it makes you feel good. But I can tell you for free that when she was washing my feet, I wasn't sitting there thinking, oh yeah, I'm a king and I deserve this. Yeah, keep you missed a spot. That was not what I felt. I didn't feel that way because it was someone who loved me and someone who I love who was serving me in this unique way. And the thought that I have was rather, how can I serve and love her better? How can I serve the one who has served me in this way? How can I be of greater service to this person who has decided to serve me in this way? That is a feeling I had, because it wasn't a pedicure that I paid for, but it was someone who loved me who was deciding to do something or a gesture which made me feel this way. That should be our response to Christ. Because when Christ came, he crouched down and he washed us with his blood. The blood that he poured out on the cross is what cleanses us. And we do not sit and say, oh, I'm a king. I deserve this. No. But when we recognize that he loves us, and when we develop in our hearts a love for him, our natural response is, how can I love him better? How can I serve my Lord better? If we are to build the kingdom of God, we need to adopt the mind of Christ and serve. How then shall we live? We should live in service to God and to one another. Though that was how Christ lived. And if we were to boast about having the mind of Christ, let it be seen in the level of service that our lives output. And when you pray and ask him, I can guarantee you for free that Christ will point you in the direction of others. He will tell you to go and wash the feet, the feet of your brothers and sisters in Christ. He will tell you that at church, go and serve in this way. Do not allow yourself to sit and just receive, because at the end of the day, we do not deserve the kindness that was extended towards us. We do not ex deserve the level of service and love that has been lavished on us. But what we can do in response to seeing it, what we can do with response to our hearts understanding it, is to go out and serve others. And what Christ would say is, have the same mind that I did. Go out there and serve others. He will point you as well to your neighbors and say, go and wash their feet as well. Even as Sia gave the example of going out and evangelizing in the neighborhood, which is Salasala, where we, are, where we are located, that is part of going and washing the feet of your neighbors. Go and interact with them. Go and build relationships. 
go and speak the truth of the gospel to them. And Christ would also say, go and wash the feet of those who will never say thank you, and go and wash the feet of those who oppose you and criticize you. Christ will also point us to our enemies if we are serious about pursuing the, life, the mind of Christ. He will tell you to go and wash the feet of those who hate you, because Christ also washed Judas's feet, and Judas betrayed him at the end of the day. Christ will tell you to have the same mind that was in him and to serve not just those within the church, but your neighbors and also your enemies. Pray for them. Don't pray for their destruction and downfall, but pray for them with a heart that loves and understands what Christ has done for you and the fact that he came to serve. Amen. How then shall we live? We shall live with the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. The final point is obedience to God to the point of death. Now something to highlight about the context is that Paul wrote Philippians 2 after he wrote 1 Corinthians 2. He wrote 1 Corinthians 2 and said we have the mind of Christ. But in Philippians 2, Paul was at the end of his life. Paul was in chains and he was facing impending death. He was close to this death and yet he was still serving the churches by writing letters to them. And I believe as he was writing letters to them, the Holy Spirit granted him a revelation of the detail of the pillars that were the frame of the mind of Christ. Because Christ, Paul was in chains because of obedience to God. Paul was about to face death because he obeyed God. And what he see here is I believe he understood what obedience to the point of death meant. Because he was about to be executed. Or rather, he was in the season of his life where he was about to be executed. And these are one of his last letters that he wrote. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, revealed to him the key pillars of Christ's mind because that was what he was living out himself. Obedience even to the point of death. And this is a hard one because even as we pray and even as we serve and live out our Christian lives, we will encounter times where the instruction will be, to a place of discomfort, where the instruction will be to a place of suffering and pain. And we say no, and the reason we say no is because it's too hard, because comfort is better, because Lord, do you want me to die, is the questions we would ask him. But Paul wrote this truth in chains, facing impending death. And as he wrote it, he knew he was going to die, and his advice was still the same, this is how Christ will do it, do the same. The mind of Christ is so conformed to the will of God that it will say yes, whether it's to the palace or to a jail cell. The mind of Christ will say yes, whether it's to a crowd or whether it's to obscurity. We do not go out there seeking death, but we carry a mindset that says, I will go to discomfort if that's where you're calling me. I will go to suffering if that is where your path leads. And I will say yes to your will, even if it leads to a grave. For the glory of your name and for your will and your power and your kingdom always. That is the attitude and the mindset that Christ carried. And Paul, as he was living it out, said that this is the same mind that we should have. It's a bit more difficult to say amen to the statement, I have the mind of Christ but we have the mind of Christ through his spirit. However, these are the noteworthy pillars of the mind of Christ. This is his attitude. This is his mindset. This is what was worth talking about, Paul says. This is the mind we have received and we should endeavor to express it through our lives. It is different from the human mind. It is much higher than, a, it's much higher because it's counter what our flesh would desire. But this is the mind that Christ carried within himself. Romans 8, 6 says, speaking about the ways of this world and, and all of the creative and the mighty things that people have created with their minds, Romans 8, 6 says, for to be carnally minded in death is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. 
every great thing that anything was, I mean, any great thing that found itself, or rather that was founded in the mind of someone, will come to nothing, will come to death if it was done independent of God. But to have the spirit, I mean, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The way that Paul lived his life was life and peace. The way that Christ expressed himself was life and peace. And that is what we are called to have or to cultivate within ourselves. So the question may be, why is it so noteworthy? And why are these pillars of the mind of Christ so noteworthy? Why did the Holy Spirit in his wisdom want to highlight these aspects and not any other aspects of the capacity of the mind of Christ? And the, tr and the reason is because Christ could only do these things in a man in time, or rather he could only do these things as a man in time. And what I mean by that is in his position in heaven in eternity past, he sat in the highest position of power and all of heaven knew who he was. In heaven, he could never empty himself of his reputation because everyone in heaven knew that he was God. He could not empty himself. There was no disguise that he could wear, and, he would not, and they would not allow him to take on a position of a servant. Everyone in heaven would fear and revere him. Yet here in time, he was born in a banda, and he was raised in a small, obscure village. In a, to a simple family, something that he could only accomplish as a man in time. In eternity past, the word who became flesh could never serve because millions upon millions upon millions of angels served and worshipped and bowed at, at, in the throne room before him day and night. The greatness and the grandeur of Christ in heaven being served day and night by a myriad of angels is what he left to come down and wash our feet. He could never do that in eternity past. But as a man in time, as a man in time, he could serve us in this way. As a man in time, Christ had the opportunity to come down and wash, and wash our feet and to die on our behalf. It's noteworthy to say that he served because it is the only way that he could serve if he agreed to death on a cross. In eternity past, he could never be separated from the Father. Because as a Godhead, they existed in perfect harmony. As a Godhead, they existed in perfect union. In eternity past, he could never die. Yet when he walked the earth as a man, he put on mortality and was subject to the frailty of humanity. He was obedient to the Father every step of the way along a path that led to the cross. And on the cross, for the first time, he experienced separation from the Father. For it is on him that lay all the sins of the world. And for the first time we see God die. Obedience to the point of death is noteworthy about the mind of Christ. Because that is what he, he could only do when he accepted the assignment of coming to earth to die on our behalf. This is the mind that was in Christ. And these are the noteworthy pillars of the attitude of his mindset. And this is what we are called to carry as believers, as the mind of Christ. Paul didn't mention his capacity in wisdom and in power and in might, 
Because in eternity past, he was all of those things at a much higher level. But in time, when he walked here, he was humble, he served, and he was obedient to the point of death. And I love Philippians verse 2 and 9 because of verse 2. Um, chapter 2, verse 9, that says, Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth. And that the every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 9 starts off by saying, therefore. Therefore, meaning that it is for this reason. It is because Christ had this attitude of mind. It is because Christ was humble, because he served, and because he was obedient to the point of death that God himself exalted him. God himself exalts those who carry the mind of Christ. We unfortunately have minds that instead will devise ways of self-exaltation even in the church. We decide how we should exalt ourselves and we do not allow God to do it because we reject to have the mind and the attitude that Christ himself had. Christ did not exalt himself. God the Father exalted him because when he looked at his life that was a sacrifice, he said, this is the one who will sit at the highest point in Zion in heaven. And this is the one who will rule and reign forever and ever. That is what God did for Christ. And it is because of the mind that he carried that we ourselves, or rather that we see God exalt him. It is this mind and this attitude and this way of thinking that God himself exalts. May we not cling on to reputation with a deb grip. May we not refuse to serve others. And may we not refuse to obey the Lord. May we not be those who say, I love him, and yes, I'll participate with parts of my life. I will even pray, but I will not yield because if he calls me to the cross of discomfort, I will say no. Yet when Christ walked the earth, he said, if you desire to follow me, you will take up your cross and you will follow me. You will take up the cross and follow him daily. We don't go looking for suffering or persecution or death, but should it cross our path, we should with the same mind of Christ say, yes, I will do it. Yes, I will do it with the same mind that was in Christ. I will obey you, Lord. That is how we should live. And that is the mindset we carry that powers the output. I mean, it is the mindset we carry that powers the output of our lives. And when Paul says we have the mind of Christ, and later on in his life close to death, when he writes what the mind of Christ actually is, when we study it, may we ourselves cultivate humility, service, and obedience to God. In the place of prayer, we ask for grace and strength. But when we go out into the world, how then shall we live? We shall live with the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. There's a poem here that I want to write. I mean, sorry, read. Um, it was written by someone, uh, well, it was quoted by someone called Zach Poonen, but I couldn't find the name of the author. And it says this about God. He says, I am seeking for one who will wait and watch for my beckoning hand, my eye, who will work in my manner the work I give and the work I give not pass by. And all oh, the joy that is brought to me when one as such, as when one such as this I can find, a man who will do all my will who is set to study his master's mind. A man who will do all my will, who is set to study his master's mind. Let us cultivate a life that expresses the mind of Christ that was revealed in scripture. The mind of Christ that we have access to through the Holy Spirit. May we not just look at seeking more wisdom and more power and more light but may we prioritize the pillars that Paul himself wrote in chains before death, that this is the same mind that should be in you. Be humble, serve others, and obey God. Let us stand and pray.
Father God, your thoughts are far above our thoughts. Your ways are far above our ways. We do not have your mindset. We do not carry your attitudes. We do not know your mind. We do not think your thoughts, but we pray, Lord Jesus, that you help us to think the way you'd think. Not just in church and not just in the prayer place, but in life's everyday situations. May you give us the mind of Christ. We surrender our ways of thinking. We surrender our ways of operating. We surrender our own ambitions, Lord Jesus. We surrender our plans to you. And we take up the mind of Christ. We take up your mind and may you help us with this. May you form within us humility that does not cling to reputation, but that serves others and prefers others in love. May we, Lord Jesus, be moved to serve our neighbors, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, and even our enemies. And Father God, by your grace, may we obey you, even when you're calling us to the difficult things, even when you're calling us to a place of suffering, even when you're calling us to an early grave. Father God, we do not know where it is you will lead us, but we will take up our cross and follow you wherever you lead. And may we live out with the same mind that was in Christ, by your grace and by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.